Then I learned about Bear Town. Have you heard of Bear Town? It's over the border in Wyoming, 10 miles south of Evanston, on the Mirror Lake Road. It was one of these railroad towns which uh, have become, become called in our modern day Hell on Wheels. These were little communities that, that, that just uh, that, that erupted, I guess we could say, because they were wild, uh, as the railroad was progressing along, and they were just temporary settlements. Bear Town was one of these. It was described uh, in a newspaper as the most, if not the most wicked town in America. It, uh, it had some good people in it. Uh, there was a general store, a livery stable, uh, uh, saloons and all of this. It just, it, it grew to 2,000 people overnight almost. But there was a rough element there too. And, uh, and the, uh, so the good guys formed a, a vigilante group and they decided they were going to uh, go get the guys that they knew were responsible for some crimes. So they went and they hung a couple of them. And then the bad guys got organized and came after them. And they holed up in the general store and they had just got in a new shipment of Henry Rivals. So when the bad guys came down the street, they opened up and in the first volley, 15 of them were dead. Now there's four or five different uh, versions of the history. One says that there were 58 dead in this war. Another one says uh, maybe 18. So 18 to 54 or whatever. Uh, but this went on and was not stopped until soldiers came from Fort Bridger to stop it. And it became the bloodiest battle in the history of Wyoming uh, uh, between white people. Uh, there was one man that tried to stop it. Another little fascinating story. His name was Tom Smith. He'd been a policeman in um, New York. He'd been involved in, uh, in, in a uh, shootout with some, some bad guys. And among the bad guys was a 14-year-old kid that got killed. And he felt so, so bad about this. He decided that he wasn't going to carry a gun anymore in his law enforcement work. Uh, he was a professional boxer, so he, from then on, he would subdue his, uh, the bad guys with his fists. He ended up uh, actually coming west, became uh, a teamster for the uh, railroad, and was in Town. and they knew he had experience in law enforcement, so they asked him to be the sheriff, and he tried to stop the war, but he couldn't do it. But he did, he tried so hard that he was given a nickname. So he has forever, from there, from then until now, he's known as Tom Bear River Smith. He went on to uh, Abilene, Kansas, where he became the sheriff. And there in a shootout with, with bad guys, he was killed and they <coughs> almost took his head off. But he became a real hero. In fact, Dwight Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, was from there. And every time he'd come back to his committee, he would go to the cemetery and he would put flowers on Tom Bear River Smith's grave. Um, Bear River, of course, starts in Yemen, Summit County. So we're talking about Summit County here. Uh, but a little downstream where all this happened in, in Bear Town. I finally found the exact spot. I have, I have on my website pictures of the, an old picture that shows the skyline, and my picture that shows a perfect match with, in the skyline. And I walk, and uh, the uh, writings on it says that there are no artifacts, there's no relics, nothing left. And I said, there's got to be something. And so I walked all over that area, and I found an old piece of wood. I said, this has got to be from, from Beartown. So I took a picture of it. And so I went on the, in my, photo, on my YouTube video, a report on this, I, uh, I said, oh, this is probably from Beartown, you know, this is... <laughs> And then, of course, I found a, a Bud Light bottle, and I took a picture of that, too, and threw it report just to add a little humor to the whole thing, you know. But, uh, so there's another uh, aspect of, uh, of the high winners. Um, but uh, I, I started looking for all these sites and, and other sites that had never been found. And, in fact, some of you maybe have seen... You can get this uh, at the Bear River Ranger Station. They don't have it here in Camas, because this is out of their jurisdiction. But it, it's about the tie hackers. 
Uh, you can get it, of course, in Evanston or over at Mountain View. And by the time I got through, well, I'm not actually through yet, uh, I have modified the map and added to it a whole bunch of other sites. Oh, nice. Uh, <laughs> many more than were on the original Forest Service map. Uh, part of this exploration and discovery uh, deals with the Hilliard Plume. Have you heard of the Hilliard Plume? Anybody? Now this starts in Summit County on Gold Hill, which is to the west of the Mirror Lake Road and you come down towards Wyoming. They built a V-shaped flume that had to maintain a very constant uh, angle down so that the, uh, the uh, lumber products would travel at about 15 miles an hour. And they would make it from Gold Hill down to Hilliard, Wyoming, where there was uh, 32 uh, charcoal kilns uh, carrying these wood products. In some places, they would have to build trestles up high, as high as 16, I've even read 30 feet high. In some places, they had to actually make cuts through hills. Well, I went looking for the Hilliard Plume. Once again, the reports uh, that talk about in the books say there is nothing left. Well, I found and mapped a whole series of diversion dams, cuts through hills, loading platforms, and then all of a sudden it ends. Now, it's supposed to have started at a place called Mill City. It's the Mill City ghost town. You can read about it. I still haven't found anybody that's ever found it. I just got through talking to a uh, Forest Service boy over in, in Camas. I've talked to Bernard Acey, uh, the uh, Forest Service uh, Trail and Wilderness uh, Supervisor, I guess they call him, or superintendent, whatever. He's looked for it, he's never found it. I've never found it, and I've made three trips into the city to try and find a little city ghost town. Well, I haven't found it yet. If anybody has any first-hand information, I would really appreciate it. That's one of my questions. That's one of the mysteries still. Uh, but at the uh, presentation in Edmiston, I was, the fellow came up to me afterwards and said, uh, this is confidential, but look, I have on my property some remnants of the plume, the Hilliard plume. He invited me to go out there and spend the night. And so in the report I made last year, uh, I had, there's actually two reports of, of my speech in Evanston. I had to divide it into two. But on the second one, I actually show the remnants that I was up. I didn't uh, I was careful in not using his name nor mentioning the property. He doesn't want it overrun by people. Uh, and so we did find some remnants of the, of the Hilliard plume. Uh, there was a few feeder plumes to keep the water uh, up because actually Gold Hill, I can't understand it, there isn't enough water there in that creek to actually operate a, a plume to carry lumber products down into Wyoming. There must have been a lot more water back then or so that's another mystery for me. But there was a how feeder plume that comes out of Middle or Main Fork, which comes out of uh, Hell, Hell's, uh, Hell's Basin, I guess it is. Uh, once again, Summit County, we we're talking about. But there was this how feeder plume, and I went looking for that. It took me two trips, but I finally found remnants of that, and I have all kinds of, uh, of uh, pictures of of old rotted planks and the, uh, uh, the braces and, and the uh, support structures. And I might as well, I wasn't going to do this right now, but I might as well do it now. Uh, here are some of the remnants. Uh, up in Edison, they asked, well, do you, did you have, do you have any artifacts? And I said, well, I, I really don't. Uh, and then I told them, I, I guess I should say this first, I said, but this morning I did my jogging out on the railroad, you know, the, and, and so I now have some artifacts, and so I showed them, so this is what I found on my little jog along the railroad tracks in Edmonton. It's an old piece of wood, and it's just got to be from the kayak, right? <laughs> this is from the old period. Oh, and there is a, a, another period of tie hackers from 1912 until about uh, 1940. Actually, 1946 was the last uh, drive, tie had drive down the river, and that was out of the wind rivers. Uh, so this would have been from the old period. And then, of course, I picked up another couple of artifacts along the railroad. 
you know. And uh, and so I, they thought it was pretty funny for me to have come up with some artifacts. Yeah. Uh, but I actually do have a few. Uh, and there's square nails. Now, the square nails are important in that before 1910, all the nails were square nails. And so in looking at a site to determine how, whether it was from the early period or the late period, you could look at a lot of things. The old period, they were small, they had no windows, uh, they didn't have stoves in, they had fireplaces. So there would be rocks in, in, they had a fireplace of some kind inside, uh, usually very low door, very small, and usually they're mostly rotted away now. Uh, but then you look for nails. If you can find square nails, you probably got, if all the other identification characteristics are, are there, uh, that pretty well confirms it's from the old period. And so these on the top are all from the Howe Peter plume. Uh, these, there were 80 tons of these square nails that were used to put together the Howe Peter plume and the Hilliard plume. You can come up and see these afterwards. Now, I had a few from the Piedmont. As I mentioned, uh, there are no trespassing signs, but I met Kelly there, and she said, oh, you can go see him. Of course, you know, Kelly, uh, the, the Guild family now owns that property, so it's the Guild family that approved the no trespassing sign, and Kelly is from the Burton family, so her telling me I could go do it uh, didn't really have any, <laughs> any weight, you know, but I just ignored that, you know, and, and I went and explored the cabin, just picked up a few square nails. Uh, and then, of course, I had to run home. And then, last year, uh, I haven't found anybody yet that knows about what went on up the middle fork of Black's Fork. And I've asked this question all over. There's no reports. The port, not with the Forest Service. Of course, the Forest Service didn't exist until about 1904, 1905. So in that early period, there was no control over what was taken out of the forest. So the Forest Service has nothing, nobody mentions Middle Fork. Well, I went up there last year to crisscross back and forth and, and try and find every tie hacker site. And I found 14 of them, measured them, photographed them, uh, dated them, and recorded them on, on my YouTube video. There was one that was from the old period. The others were up higher altogether. And I concluded on the, the new period, mostly the, the Thai hackers were Scandinavians, uh, Swedes, mostly some Finns, a few Danes, uh, and they, uh, they had their stuck houses. This is a tradition among them. And so I found in one of the sites uh, a couple that looked, a couple of uh, sites that looked like they were uh, sweat houses. Um, so I found uh, a, a lot of stuff up Middle Fork and, and have a map of that. The, um, so that, that I, I think it was a Swedish community actually, and there was one central uh, ruin, very large, 36 feet long by about 18 feet wide. That was probably their dining hall, the cook house, dining hall, uh, and, and there are signs that it had a wood floor, a very crude wood floor. But uh, these dining halls, the cookhouse and dining hall, they were used for dances and social gatherings uh, on, on the weekends. So this is some of what, uh, what I gathered. Uh, I guess I, I could show you what I did bring home from where I did find some remnants of the, of the, uh, of the Hilliard plume. See if I can get this open here. But this was a piece that it was part of a brace. You can see the angle. This was the angle actually of the flume. Uh, yeah, here they are. Yeah, this is. So there were a bunch of square nails. But square nails, you know, you think, oh, okay, it's all right. Uh, but square nails are a big thing when you're trying to identify the ruin, whether it's from the old period or new period. So there they are. You can uh, so anyway, the, my journey about uh, the, the tie hackers has been absolutely incredible. Once again, one question, 
middle work, bike store. If anybody knows anything, if anybody has an old diary or something. <laughs> the problem with this early period, most of the people didn't know how to read and write. And so there's just nothing. The books about the Thai actors are all from the new period. There's nothing from the old period. I would love to find some letters from one of these guys. Now, there's a place called Suicide Park, for example, uh, uh, there was, where three of the Thai actors were buried. Now, they were all from the newer period. This was uh, about 18, 28, and 30, and they got old, and there was, they couldn't do anything else. There was no social, social security. They had no family to take care of them, and there were three of them who just took their lives. And they're buried in a place. If you go, it's uh, from the, if you went to that guard station and the Still Creek, uh, it's, there's a uh, road that takes off uh, to the north uh, towards Wyoming, and it's right on the Wyoming border. It's, it's pretty deteriorated the last time I was there, but there are markers there for the three tight hackers. Now from this uh, newer period, uh, there was one black that in my youth would call Negroes. That was an accepted terminology, you know, back in those days. There weren't any from the old period, but there was one from the new period. His, his last name was Brown. And new Thai hackers that would come, they were just recently uh, uh, arrived from, from uh, Europe, and they'd look at him, and, and, and he'd say, well, as long, once you've been here as long as I have been here, you look just like me. <laughs> <laughs> and he had these young people just scared to death, you know, <laughs> what was going to come out of them being a Thai But so that's one of the interesting, fascinating uh, aspects of the North Slope of the U.N. is, and it's all Summit County. Everything I've uh, discovered, uh, except for those things that are crossed into Wyoming, it's all from Summit County. And so it's a pretty special place. Now, there's also some uh, beautiful areas of Summit County. Let me show you something. And this is going to be a gift. Now, me is going to figure out what to do with it. This is considered by many people. Maybe I better take it over here and, and show the camera. Okay, can you see the camera? <laughs> this is Red Castle Peak, that many people consider the most beautiful mountain uh, seen in Utah. Now that's debatable. I'm sure you have your favorite area that's maybe the gifts but, but I would like to donate this to uh, the the courthouse or the museum or whatever you know you see. In all of this I have backpacked sixteen hundred miles and I uh, and throughout all, all these 1,600 miles, I have had every kind of experience you could imagine. Most of them have been alone, and that is not advisable. I would not, I wouldn't want any of my kids to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want anybody to do it unless they take all the precautions that I take. Uh, in spite of my age, uh, to be ready, oh, I, I, I got to explain first. Over these years, I have had problems, a whole series of them. My football ankle that I complained about and lived because of for many years is now held together with three screws and a tendon transplant. That finally wore out on one of my hikes. Well, my motorcycle knee that also had me limping finally wore out, and so it's a titanium knee. It looks awful, but it works. <laughs> When you get to my age, you know, you don't care what you look like, you care what you feel like. <laughs> I had a heart attack, overcame that, came out of the mountain. I've had a number of survival experiences, and, and I, before this, uh, the backpacking starts, I'm going to do a special YouTube video on survival, talking about all of the experiences I have had, hyperthermia, lightning, about everything you can imagine. I have not encountered a bear yet. I do take my Colt 45 Defender with me, but uh, so I'm going to talk about survival. But with me, everything has either been rebuilt, reconstructed, replaced, <coughs> except my brain, I guess. I finally, uh, what was it, two years ago, I guess, 
I, I was really starting to have a real tough time. It was just getting harder every year. And then I, I went in, I went back to the doctor who had done my knee, and I told him about what was happening, and so he sent me to somebody else, and all of a sudden I was told, hey, you've got to have an operation on your back. You've got a pinched nerve, and that's causing pain down your left leg, which was my good leg. So I had to went back surgery. That helped a little, but not enough. And I started that I was working hard during that. This, uh, this was the summer of 2012, where, during which I didn't do any backpacking back at all. But I was doing, I was working out, I was trying to figure out how to be able to keep moving. So I did a, a series of comeback videos, kind of laughing about myself, uh, quoting uh, Winston Churchill when he said, never, never, never give in, you know? Uh, and so that's what I was saying, I can't give in. Well. It was getting hard. <laughs> I, finally, I finally added to it, never, never give in easily. <laughs> I added a little to that. I finally, things were getting worse rather than better. And so my comeback videos all of a sudden were changed. I did just one or two with the title being Fake Not Being a Cripple. Okay, you can't overcome being a couple but you just learn to fake not being one. <laughs> so I was learning to walk in a different way and, 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 and somehow disguise it and be able to keep moving. And, but basically what I was doing, I was admitting that I was a cripple. And it really started depressing me. This would have been like in March of last year. And so I, I thought, well, I've got to resign myself I get to be a cripple. I mean, hey, you know, this happens to everybody. Sooner or later, uh, in one way or the other. And then I thought, I've got to give the doctors one more chance. So I wrote my doctor a letter to describe what was happening. And my kids said, the doctor's not going to answer your letter. They want you in the clinic so you they get your money. But you know, all of a sudden, one night, I got a call from my doctor, from his home. He'd gone over my letter. He'd gone over all the MRIs and the x-rays and everything they'd done on me. He said, I think, I think we can do something for you. So I went in the next morning. And they set up another procedure with another doctor. It didn't work either. So I went back to the second doctor. and said, hey, it didn't work. Uh, and, and I said, you don't really know me. You don't really know my history. Let me tell you. And so I explained what had been going on. And he said, I think I know what your problem is. Let's take an x-ray. And so I took an x-ray and he put it up on the monitor and he, uh, he said, look, I don't even know how you're walking. You're bone on bone on your left hip. You need hip replacement surgery. So I went back to the doctor that did my knee and so he did me a titanium <laughs> hip. And for the first time in 30 years, I'm without pain. So in spite of my age, I don't have any excuse anymore to not keep backpacking. <laughs> and so I have scheduled 14 more trips, 430 miles. I'm not going to do it one summer. I might not be able to do it in two summers. I've even stretched it out well. Maybe into my 81st year, I'm going to be backpacking still. You know? I don't know for sure how it's going to go. But... I have found that with my body, I have to keep moving every single day. Every day this year, I have gone out, it's, no matter what the weather, I have gone out and walked around at least a big block and more when I could with a pack on my back. January, 45 pounds. February, 50 pounds. March, 55. I'm now going, doing it with 60 pounds, and today will be the first day I have not done it all year. And I've got an excuse. I'll, you know, I'm a cold bill. <laughs> I forgot to bring my pack with me. <laughs> and I'm not going to drive off tonight and do it before midnight. So. The conversation ended soon after this point, but it will have to be the beginning of part two, along with the highlights of the very enthusiastic question and commentary period that went on for quite a while. Let me just mention that in that part two, other adventurous and mysterious aspects of the Uintas will be mentioned, including gold in the Uintas, 
of legendary Spanish gold mines, including the Lost Roads Mine, and participation in that history of Butch Cassidy and his wild bunch. Also mentioned will be made of the first mountain man rendezvous in the west on the Henry's Fork River that comes out of the U.N.S. Plus, a bit about the legend of Bigfoot and my efforts to give him, or it, a chance to find me so I could take his family portrait. Also very important, I will answer questions about survival and what I do that others should do too. Also a question about uh, the, the greatest outdoor experience that I had, and I will explain what that was. Uh, let's end seeing more of the beauty of the only major mountain range that goes 150 miles from east to west um, uh, in the lower 48 states, about which has been written. This is from Morris Udall, U.S. Representative, who reported, From a wildlife primitive recreation and watershed standpoint, the high Uintas are Utah's most significant wild area, and indeed, are one of the most diverse and interesting wildlands ecosystems in the entire nation. Along with the San Juan Mountains in Colorado, the Uintas have more contiguous area above Timberline than any other area in the United States. And from the Intermountain Flora magazine, according to Intermountain Flora, the Uintas area above Timberline in a true alpine flora surpasses all of the alpine areas in the Intermountain West combined. Last of all, keep an eye on my website to see the backpack scheduled and hopefully one by one they will be accomplished as I'm determined to do as Winston Churchill recommended, never, never give in, and as I have added, never give in easily. I will do my best to not let death be boring. I've lived well, I've adventured widely, I will not die poorly. So if I end up being, uh, my demise being explained on the 10 o'clock news in the next couple of summers, uh, nobody has to feel bad about it. Thanks for listening. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation and I hope that we can all uh, meet on the trail up in the high Uintas during the next couple of summers.